Good morning, Think Tech Hawaii. Good morning. <clears throat> Rule of law in the new abnormal, whatever that may be. And welcome. We have just another truly stellar all-star panel here today. I'm going to start with Professor Vernalia Randall, Professor Emerita, University of Dayton School of Law, and one of the leading experts anywhere on race, racism, and the law, which is particularly germane, germane to what we're going to be talking about today. Ben Davis, Professor Emeritus from University of Toledo School of Law, and now teaching with the University of Illinois School of Law in Chicago. Yep. Uh, remotely. Hey, and Ben is in Virginia, where he's been able to look at some historical presidential sites and ancestral homelands, in a sense. Yep. 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 Tina Patterson in Germantown, New Jersey, has mastered many trades, business, entrepreneurial, mediation, arbitration, both domestic and international. Hey, and Doug Chin, our former Hawaii Lieutenant Governor and Attorney General, now a partner at Star and O'Toole Marcus and Fisher, one of our leading commercial law firms. Hey, and welcome, Doug, with Professor Randall, Ben Davis, Tina Patterson. Today, we're going to dive as deeply as we choose into freedom of thought, expression, and the restrictions on that, not only in academic freedom, but in all sectors that we're seeing put into place by particular groups. Which are the ones that concern you the most? Ben, you brought this up. You want to start us off? All right. Um, so the, the, at the first level, um, I think there's an effort at, uh, I've become aware of at the University of uh, Georgia system to end tenure, all right? Now, most people out there say, what's tenure and what does it mean to me and all that? But uh, what I can say in the academic space, at least for me personally, the sense of tenure was the opportunity to think freely on a topic and not feel any uh, risk, as long as you're a reasonable person in terms of not doing weird things at your school, but uh, on, on any topic that you were thinking of uh, working on and having the freedom to explore it, uh, to uh, whatever the views of powers that be might be on this or that point. It was that freedom that, uh, that you get from tenure that uh, is, allows for the, uh, the more, I think, uh, rich uh, intellectual processes in universities. So one part is, the University of Georgia kind of threat to tenure that's going on now, and I understand other places too. Second aspect of this would be uh, boards of trustees putting pressure uh, on um, deans um, and deans uh, possibly succumbing to the pressure with regards to somebody who is quote unquote doing something that is out of line with what some member of the board of trustees thinks is appropriate. Um, and uh, that kind of uh, whispering in the ear to a professor that what they can't talk about this or that in their, in their classroom, um, the distinction between a dean being able to maybe say something, which is a whole issue in itself, and the professor having the academic freedom in their pedagogy and what they're trying to teach their students in their classroom is a real concern that I have that people are feeling pressures like that. I know of people who are feeling pressures like that and having to deal with it. And my concern is I know of people who are leaving schools because of they can't take the pressure. A third kind of uh, issue of this is uh, a professor who talks about things that they think are important. And you know some group in, of students in the classroom don't want to hear it. So they start a whole protest thing up to the dean and all that about this professor talking about things that they don't feel comfortable with hearing, okay? And, um, and the professor may have the view that this is important. In fact, some case books may have sections on it that point, point out that as part of the pedagogical process, this is helping people to understand whatever the rules are or the particular topic is. And uh, 
and this kind of, again, whispering to the professor to please don't talk about it. I'm not talking about a professor being obnoxious or acting irresponsibly or anything. I'm talking about somebody who, as part of their academic goal, uh, goal of preparing people in their classroom, are being told to, quote unquote, trim their sails a bit away from what would be totally uh, in another environment, let's say in three, four years ago, five years ago, would have not been controversial at all and would have actually been something totally, totally normal. Um, and those, those are the kinds of things that, that, that I worry about. Uh, the last one I just want to add is when you have uh, legislatures that are passing laws saying you can't talk about something in the classroom, whatever that means, uh, because, uh, you know, for example, that there might be a professor who teaches environmental law and the legislature will pass a law saying you can't speak about climate change. How can you teach environmental law to people when you can't talk about climate change? You know what I mean? Um, but obviously critical race theory, which by the way, is carrying a lot of weight as a term, uh, not being able to talk about it. I live here in Charlottesville, Virginia, <laughs> okay? Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, you know, the, the capital of the South in, in, in the Civil War, uh, race pervades this history. It, but the blood then, is in the ground. Then I, I guess I want to separate the, the, the legislative action from the other kinds of things that you mentioned. But my experience ha, is that that's been going on. I've, I've been in legal education for 30 years. It has followed me the entire 30 years of my teaching of the exact behavior that you're talking about. Uh, I got taken out of classes. I got petitions made up against me because I was teaching race and racism. I got told that it wasn't an issue of academic freedom, uh, that it was an issue of a dean's right. And there was no media to rally around. <laughs> you know, right, it, right. It, and I think, and I'm not saying I was unique. I think that that kind of thing was happening to people who was teaching about race and racism in the 90s. Okay. Where, and, and wherever they the happened to sit, right. wherever they happened to sit in the 80s and, you know, what right. really is different to me it, it, even even uh, 15 years ago, there was discussion about getting rid of tenure. So that discussion's not even new. What's new, though, I think, to this whole process is the legislature passing actual laws saying, you know, you can't talk about that. And I'm wondering if this is, I, you know, if, if I'm wondering if this is sort of like, they know that can that, that it really can't stand up under challenges, but the idea is to damp down the uh, discussion while challenges are happening, which could take year, two, three years uh, right. to, to overturn the laws. So I'm not sure that I think the laws are legal. I think the, but the impact will be that until they are litigated out, uh, they'll, it'll have an impact of damping discussion. But I think that's the only difference I see, not the other right. things you mentioned. But, okay, well then what, what I would say to you is um, in the common denominator of all these things for me is instilling fear, okay? Instilling fear in the professor as to what they're going to do to create a second guess idea in the professor's head. And, and you know, we, I'm not gonna go down with the old chilling effect thing. I'm just saying that, the, the, you know, it's enough fear trying to get to tenure, okay? I mean, about, you know, whether everyone in the faculty will vote for you and all that stuff, okay? But in addition to that, now setting up rules that uh, have the effect of making a professor hesitate, like, oh my gosh, does this term I'm talking about, like, uh, the water crisis in Flint, is that talking about climate change? So I can't talk about it because uh, that somehow that might be conceived as being related to climate change and climate change is something I can't talk about. I mean, that kind, I know that sounds crazy, 
but I'm telling you that, that instilling that second guessing in your head, uh, as opposed to you being in the pedagogical space of trying to teach what is the things that you think are useful for your students to be uh, uh, best prepared for what they're gonna have to face out in the real world. That is really what I feel is about trying to get us all to feel fear, okay? And fear in this sense that obviously, oh my goodness, you're not gonna get tenure or, uh, or alternatively it's fear like you're going to be moved around, all the kinds of things that you describe. But these are all efforts of instilling fear. And right now it seems to be that there's an, an effort to really heighten the amount of fear and to basically repress thought or intellectual in, uh, intellectual uh, adventurism, intellectual uh, exploration to have something that even seems a little bit like trying to have a par party line. And uh, it's very totalitarian to me, uh, especially when the legislatures get involved. That's the word that came to my mind is that this is a very totalitarian, you know, remaking the past in terms of what is acceptable. I heard one professor talk about a lot of their students have had the Disney version of American history and that they are confronted with this and trying to explain them. And I know Professor Randall, you've had to spend time in your classes just having people understand the history, you know, because you can't even get to the theories because they, they don't understand, they don't even know the history. And, uh, and that can be controversial just to tell the histories differently. Here's one thing I will tell you that I learned recently when I was visiting James Madison's plantation, which is that the Marquis de Lafayette in 1824, when he was doing his national tour, sort of everybody thanking him for what he did in the Revolutionary War, visited uh, James Madison for four days at his plantation. And the first two days he spent talking to the slaves or the enslaved people about what they were going through. And at the dining room table, when he was there with Madison, he spent a lot of time trying to convince Madison to get rid of his slaves, to free them. I hadn't heard that until I was out at the plantation. I know about Marquis de Lafayette from all we know about from back in the Revolutionary War part. But apparently he even said, you know, I'm not sure I would have come back here if I knew you were gonna keep your slaves. Well, now, was that controversial? You know. It, that's history, that's reality. But that, that, that kind of thing might be, oh, you're talking critical race theory or something or that's gotta be I, I still I still feel like that. I, I, I understand what you're saying. And maybe it's just, I've been fighting this so long that it doesn't feel different to me. It, it wow. really doesn't feel different to me. It feels like more of the same uh, uh, and, uh, and I don't know. I mean, it, it I, is well, about a feeling steer, but it's been about instilling, instilling fear as long as I've known it. Oh, and let me enough. ask you, Ben, just one sec before. Yeah. Let me ask you folks. Is there another very real, very practical, very threatening aspect of this fear? And that is the legislatures, state and national. Those are the funding sources for all the public schools, K-12 and university and graduate school. Well, sure, you know, there have been clinics. Doesn't that send a message that right. this law may not be enforceable, but when you come back to us for funding, if you were on the wrong side of this law, Guess where right. you're going to be on our priority list? Yeah, there, there are clinical programs that have, uh, you know, obviously somebody with some significant power or business interest has been upset about some of the work that they've been doing, and they put pressure to try to get those clinics made to be disappear because at, at law schools because they were taking on cases that were uncomfortable to that particular business interest. You know, but didn't absolutely. that start about twelve years ago? That oh, they yeah. look up. Okay, I'm, that, you, that, I'm this, just this, saying I'm that, that, yeah, that that no. that that people that 
the clinics were threatened, they have been threatened for the last 15 years by conservative uh, 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 groups who, and laws have been passed. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to think which state actually passed the law saying that the law school clinics could not represent people from a certain group. Uh, and that's, you know, that's been around a while. Yeah. Um, and it's a problem. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying this. This is this is a package. Okay, this is what we're going through in this period. Now I can tell you, in the '30s, I know that there were people who were talking pro-union stuff at different universities who were professors, and they would get hassled about their pro-union approaches. That happened at Toledo when I was there. Unfortunately, Toledo had a point of view which was that you know, hey, academic freedom. The person is free to do the research that they want to do, you know. But uh, let me add another one that's in this game: is that uh, the public and private version of the of the professor. A uh, professor goes to something as a private person, and you know how you're at it. Anything that you go to, somebody might ask you, uh, uh, General Chin. So what do you do? You know, I say, well, I was a former. I'm working with a law firm, or I used to be the attorney general, something like that. Or uh, uh, somebody asks you. Uh, uh, Ms. Patterson, you know, what do you do? Oh, I do this or that, right? Okay. All right. And then you get an article put up, like, I don't know, attorney general goes berserk in meeting, you know, like that, <laughs> right? You know, you know, right? and uh, maybe even exactly letters right. get sent to the governor, right? Yeah. Or to the head of your law firm where it is saying, we are shocked that, you know, uh, this partner said this thing or kind of thing like that when you were acting completely in your private capacity or I was shocked that where you work, uh, uh, Ms. Patterson, that they, you know, and that kind of stuff I've seen happen too, you know? And in fact, that happened to me once. It was really funny because I went to a true the vote meeting because they're talking about voter integrity back in 2012. And I asked a couple questions. The place went crazy on my questions, right? I was the only black guy in there. With, anyway, they, they called the police on, and on me. Oh, I mean, all kind of crazy. And then I, you know, I, there was an article put up saying, you know, law professor goes berserk. Now, how do you know he's a law professor? I'm talking to the guy at the table today. What do you do? Oh, yeah, you know, I, I work down here. I'm just here, you know, seeing this as like ordinary citizen. I was accused of being a complaint of the Democratic Party, to be in conspiracy with the New York Times. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm giving you all the craziness. And this got back to but my I, name. I don't right? disagree. I just think that in 1987, I was working for Bullivant, Hauser, Bailey, Pentagraph, and Hoffman in Portland, Oregon. And I went to speak to a junior high school, and I've yeah. always been political. So, uh, and I pretty much told them that everybody was racist and they should say so. Right. That, and we should deal with it. When I got back to my firm, you can bet the pressure was put on me. Oh sure, okay. So, I, I mean, it's, I, I mean, the thing is, is that the, the if, let's deal with the legislative component because the personal pressure component is one that has always been around and will continue uh, uh, to be around, uh, yeah. even. Professor Randall. I hear you, but the personal pressure part too, as well as the legislative for me are all part of the same thing. And the battle we have is to fight those things. That if you are in a, that law firm and if they are going to like make you lose your position, so to speak, because of what you said in that kind of setting, that's a comment on them, not on you. You understand? In, the, in, the, in, in academia, there's this kind of intellectual process you're supposed to go through and intellectual exploration that is crucial to helping our country, I think, become a, a better place. And that really want to kind of uh, protection. I, I just want to add something here, I, just to bring it home back here to Hawaii. I, I, I want to thank very much the academics here for uh, for just constantly speaking up and, and, and I want to encourage you to keep doing that more. Um, I'll tell you a quick story, which is that um, my parents were brought over by Christian missionaries to the United States. And, um, and so as a result, uh, I, I was raised in a very sheltered, uh, very conservative religious background. 
um, that taught me a lot of great things, taught me a lot about faithfulness and perseverance and mercy and things like that. It also taught me a lot of not so good things in terms of, you know, in terms of like uh, kind of just uh, what I would think about LGBTQ issues, uh, what I would think about uh, whether or not minorities should speak up or whether we should just go along and, and just, you know, let things happen um, and never say anything. And there was a lot about, there was a lot about my own culture that taught me about, you know, perhaps wrongly about, about uh, uh, just being a model minority and not saying anything. So to me, I always think to myself, when I look back in my, at my life and go, how did I go from this conservative sheltered background um, to like being a Asian American who then sued the president uh, for a Muslim ban. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How did that all happen? I'll, I'll tell you what it was. It was it was my undergraduate education and it was my law school. Okay, so by, by well, I went to Stanford. Um, you know, I actually I actually remember writing to the people at Stanford saying I'd like to have someone uh, who's my roommate who will be the same uh, religion as me because I'd feel more comfortable with that. And they just no. <laughs> they just said. Yeah. Yeah. That's not that's not what we're about. And, uh, you know, and then and then the same way, you know, when I went to law school, I remember being challenged and hearing so many different um, different viewpoints that I resisted, honestly, because of the way I'd been raised. Um, and, and yet it stuck with me. They were seeds that were planted inside me that that the longer I the longer I lived and the more I experienced things. Um, I, I was able to, you know, like change and evolve and, and grow. And, and yeah. I just want you to know that, that you're, you know, even when you think you're falling on deaf ears or, or you're feeling all this pressure, that, that as somebody who was one of the students who came from that background, um, I needed to hear that. Like I, I, I needed to be told, no, you're going to listen to a different viewpoint um, and, and to, to be able to think differently about something, because I think it really it really helped me uh, along the way. So, um, so I appreciate that. Um, just thinking about things locally here, there is no question that, um, that uh, the legislature every single year holds their funding of our universities over their heads. And I know that for people in Hawaii, we tend to think, well, we're, not, we're never gonna get to that place where you know, our progressive values will be challenged. Um, but I think that's something to always be careful of because I think Hawaii will often look at uh, what's happening on the mainland and then you know and then start adopting some of those things into their rhetoric and, and so so i appreciate uh the warning signs um it, you know or if not um the actual signs of, of racism that that could potentially be pervading and and causing our academic freedom freedoms to be stifled yeah but, but, but let me give uh, and one Just more because okay. i wanted to ask tina we're hearing now about the role and the value of this freedom of thought expression to contributing to leadership abilities to stand up, to speak up, and the individual abilities. What kind of difference has that made in your life, Tina? What learning experience have you had that have enabled you to stand up, speak up, take choices and chances and risks? I, I think much as um, Doug indicated it's the being in an environment where intellectual curiosity is welcome and supported um, undergraduate school it was encouraged to ask questions to to challenge to to literally um, make your own decision to give them what was presented to you to do the analysis thoughtful analysis intentional analysis i think back to your original question that's one of the things that concerns me most is that we're 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 seeing and we're being bombarded with the message of you don't need to think about it i'm telling you this is the message this is the message yeah. that you're going to carry forward um whether it's everyone is going to be the model african-american the model asian the model right. muslim um this this is the message that you're going to carry forward and drawing or moving outside of the lines has consequences whether that is losing your job being presented in a such a way, whether on social media or in the newspaper. So um, it, I think, Ben, you talked about this, but I, I think it really, really being um, vigilant and, and knowing that there may be a price that you, you'll have to pay for, for taking that stand. But as, as we were talking, I think about the book, How Democracies Die, and it's, this, it's that attack. Um, and it's the attack on the leaders, those who are Take a position that are is not favorable or favorite, as well as those who are, you know, holding status quo. Um, 
you know, right now there's this tug of war. And I, I think about what you said, Doug, I recently graduated from the Public Leaders for Inclusion Council um, cohort, and it was focusing on Islamophobia. And I thought how, right. you know, the focus recently in the media has been about Islamophobia, but where have we seen this repeated elsewhere? And it's the same message of you know, where do you stand on this? Do you, do you take a stand or do you just go along because it's good for whatever, fill in the blank, whether it's your, your purse or your, your reputation or your long-term career goals? Yeah, I understand very much this, this whole idea of, of like fear being this motivator. I, I remember just, you know, like even as a, as a young student feeling like, feeling afraid, you know, like I, afraid to hear a different viewpoint because somehow that would, you know, mess me up, you know, and, and, and it took professors and counselors and mentors being able to say, don't be afraid. Like, it, it's okay to think about uh, another side to this. Um, and, and I needed to hear, like, even like the smart guy I was, <laughs> you know, that was going to there, <laughs> like, I, I needed to hear that in order to, you know, to, to develop and, and to become a, a more full person. So, so I really um, appreciate that. Um, yeah. I even think about the, the fear of like, just uh, what Tina was just saying about, you know, having a fear of, um, you know, Muslims and, and it, you know, to me, um, I, I thought one of the greatest, like one of the greatest rewards from being able to uh, bring the lawsuit uh, against President Trump was meeting the, the Muslim folks, uh, the, the people in our community and, and just hearing their stories and speaking to them and, and realizing that there are so many stereotypes that I've yeah. in mind since 2001, that that was from the message that I'd been hearing so much from everybody else that, that just being able to like meet them, it was, it meant so much. And, sure. yeah. and so, and so I, I really appreciate that. This is, you know, like we, we really need those academic freedoms. On our last couple of minutes from each of you, what's the kernel the most important thing we really need to stand up and speak up for now to protect freedom of thought and expression in our learning. How do we do that? I, I think we need, uh, if I jump forward, it's very difficult, um, whether K through 12, college, or in uh, a graduate program as a teacher, but I do think that whatever the level you're at, you have to model freedom of thought for those who are your students. Um, there's a wonderful image, uh, it always comes to mind, it's an old Charles Lawton movie called This Is Our Land, where he's teaching these little kids in France and the Gasapo are coming along to arrest him. And so he finishes sort of with a wonderful soliloquy and then they're, as they're starting to take him out and they grab his two arms as they're taking him out the door. And he does this one move with his arms where he just goes like that, which is like, I walk out of my classroom as the professor, okay? I'm, you, you're, I'm not, it, it was like this kind of academic freedom, even though the system is gonna come down on him. It was this act of, defiance against efforts to make to diminish him as the person who was in instilling information to the best of his ability to his students and i think you know i i personally thought I always get moved when i see that little scene in black and white about what, what we could you know what is possible now there's a lot of fear though okay there's a lot of fear i respect that there's a lot of fear and you know, fear to be say, a motivator. I mean, I've always felt like I've always used fear in my life to move me, mm. to to wow. move me forward, to move wow. me ahead, to to do something, to use that tension in my body to step out of where I am, uh, as opposed to withdraw. But one of the things we didn't talk about, which I I think we should. I'm not for complete freedom of thought. I don't want racist, sexist, homophobic, uh, transphobic thought in my classroom. I'm sorry about it. 
and I will facilitate you trying to move out of it, but you will know that what you said, what you did, is completely unacceptable to me. Uh, you have that thought, but no, not all thoughts are acceptable. <laughs> I'm laughing because my, my foster mother used to say to us, you can think what you want, but you can't say everything. And I, you know, so I think that, that there is some truth in that, 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 and part of what we've gotten into is the feeling that if I think it, I can say it, and then I don't want any backlash from it because that's my freedom to be able to do it. No. no. Okay, so we're There's out of time for today. Well, boundaries. Yeah, that, that's a great insight, and thanks much, Professor. We're out of time for today, but we've and dive pretty deep into what our responsibility to truth really is. And part of that is the freedom to be able to get to it through critical thinking. But another part is the responsibility to put that truth first and not to sacrifice the truth for the sake of irresponsible freedom. It's a good place to wrap up today. It's a good place to come back to, and let's see where that takes us next time. Folks, thanks for joining us. Think Tech Hawaii. Keep us in mind. Our donation month begins November 1st, and we'll ask you to support us to the extent that you feel it's worthwhile and can. Professor Randall, Ben, Tina, Doug, thanks so much for joining us. Come back again in a couple of weeks. We'll be back. <laughs>